Hey, what's up guys? Hope everyone's doing really, really well. Wanted to make a quick and dedicated technical video today about a very important concept in software, and that's going to be CPU bound versus IO bound. And if you've never heard these phrases before, I hope this video can be helpful. It's, these are pretty important concepts in computing. If you've already heard this, this is too basic for you, uh, feel free to just leave. I won't feel too bad. So first of all, what is this? Well, these two phrases, you'll hear this a lot in software, but these two phrases describe the characteristics of your program. So when you write software, you can kind of describe the software you wrote. You wrote a program that was very CPU bound, or you could write a program that's very IO bound. And what does that mean? So first, let's just answer the question of why is this important? Well, writing software is just one part of software development, but we also have to always understand how that software gets executed on an actual computer or actual hardware. And that's equally important as writing the software. So pretend you just spent six months building an awesome piece of software and you're ready to deploy it somewhere. It's time to make a decision of which computers you're going to buy or which flavors of Amazon compute instances you're going to rent and how do you choose wisely. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to answer this question much better. All right, so let's just get started. The first thing I want to do again is always just review some fundamental truths for computers. So one thing I like to do when I get confused, when things start getting a little over my head, I always try to refer back to really basic fundamental truths like to kind of ground yourself because often there's so much stuff you have to learn, your brain will be overloaded that you need to just ground yourself again. And I usually do that by going back to a lot of those really, really basic truths. So we're going to do that first, just to give a premise for this whole video. But truth number one that we're going to review is that remember that all software eventually gets translated to some kind of machine instructions for the processor to execute. I'll just say it one more time. All software eventually gets translated to some kind of machine instructions. And my definition of a computer, just my own definition of a computer is that it's a bunch of software telling a bunch of hardware what to do. That's all a computer really is. And if this doesn't make sense to you at all, I'd recommend watching um, these two videos I did about how a computer works. And I talk like for 15, 30 minutes just about this truth. So all software, no exceptions, always gets translated to machine instructions. Interpreted Python code, compiled Python code, compiled C code, compiled C++ code, Java bytecodes on running on a Java runtime, assembly instructions. All of this at the end of the day is just machine instructions. So that's truth number one, and hopefully that's all that all makes sense. Truth number two is that remember that any moment in time on your computer or on your phone, any moment in time your computer is handling hundreds, hundreds of active threads active execution threads at any point in time. And it's not doing these things in parallel, but it's switching between them very, very fast and we get a crazy simultaneous experience. But our computers, they execute things very concurrently. So they execute hundreds and hundreds of things concurrently, but remember that's different than in parallel. So let's just open up Activity Monitor and showcase that real quick. So. Activity Monitor is what's on Mac OS. There's, I think, Task Manager for Windows and probably different command line tools for uh, Unix systems. But pretty much Activity Monitor just gives you a basic rundown of, you know, your computer's resources, how things are going. But when I said hundreds of threads, I just want to reiterate what hundreds of threads means. So these are all the active uh, process names on my computer right now. There's a ton of them. You can see the total count is 2,165. There's 418 processes, processes. Um, but like kernel task, whatever this is doing, has 328. Dropbox is using 153. Chrome has 51 threads going. Screen recorder, right now, screen recorder has 47 threads. So obviously, 2,000 threads at one point in time. Your computer doesn't have 2,000 cores, right? My computer probably only has four cores. But those four cores are so fast, they switch between those 2,000 threads 
really, really fast and everything gets done. So that's truth number two. So at any moment in time, your computer is handling hundreds, it's actually thousands of active threads of execution, all right? At any point in time, that's always happening. The next thing I wanna do is just go back to our chef analogy. If you've watched some of my other processor videos, computer system videos, I always make this analogy of a processor to a chef. And I, a professor told me about this analogy and I always, always go back to it because it's the easiest for me to understand at least. So just as a summary, I have a lot of other videos that talk about this, but this is a summary of those analogies. So a chef is kind of like a processor and the recipes, the food recipes are execution threads or the software that has to be run. So a processor has to execute a bunch of different threads and a chef has to execute a bunch of different recipes. If you make a beefy chef with multiple arms, that's kind of like beefing up your processor, giving your processor more hardware, having it handle hardware threads, instruction level parallelism. And if you have four chefs, if you have four beefy arm chefs with multiple arms, that's kind of like quad core processors, each with crazy capabilities. All right, so that's the basic chef analogy, and we're gonna run with this for the rest of this video. And hopefully those analogies are still ingrained in your head. So one thing I wanna do now is just revisit the truth number two and use this analogy and re restate truth number two. So at this moment in time, your computer is handling thousands of active threads of execution. It's not doing these things in parallel, it's just switching between them very fast. So using the chef analogy, at this moment in time, the chef is handling thousands of recipes to cook. The chef isn't doing all these recipes in parallel because he's just one person, but he's so fast that he can switch between all these recipes very fast. Okay, now we're on to a new truth, and this is gonna we're gonna start getting into the differences between CPU bound and I/O bound. We're almost there, but it's all gonna click. That whole introduction, I hope, is leading to this. So, truth number three is that all recipes, AKA your software, but all recipes are different. Some recipes will get faster if we get a faster chef, but some recipes will not get done faster even if we get a faster chef. So here's two examples of that, just to showcase that. You have one recipe, and this is what the recipe says. It's chop one trillion tomatoes, chop two trillion onions, and then multiply them all together. And you can see by this recipe, if you have a faster chef, he's going to get this done faster than a slower chef, right? If a faster chef can cut a million tomatoes a second, he's, he or she's going to do that much faster than a slower chef who can only cut 100 tomatoes a second. So it's very clear that given this type of recipe, faster chef is going to do it better. So let's take another recipe, recipe B. So this recipe is we want to store run one trillion recipe translations into the restaurant warehouse across town. And the thing is, for this case, the chef doesn't control how fast things get stored into the warehouse because it's not part of the kitchen. So the key point here is that no matter how fast the chef is, he's not going to be able to store the recipes into the warehouse any faster. Because what if the warehouse just has one entrance? There's only so much that can fit into one entrance over some period of time, right? So how would you ever possibly make recipe B better? But the only way to make recipe B go faster is you have to actually improve the warehouse. If the warehouse got improvements, like if the warehouse had four big doors with huge entrances, then we could actually move things into the warehouse faster and this program could actually perform better, right? So recipe B is actually bounded by how good our warehouse is. And it's not bounded at all by how fast the chef is. So if you didn't get it by now, I think recipe A is the essence of CPU bound and recipe B is the essence of IO bound. And let's take it out of abstract land and talk about some real things now. So that recipe A, CPU bound, recipe B, IO bound. So we won't, let's not talk about chef stuff anymore. Let's talk about real CPUs and programs. But the definition of CPU bound is that a thread, 
of execution or a program. This is a fancy word of just saying the software you write or your program, but a thread of execution is CPU bound if its performance is correlated with the CPU. All right, a thread of execution is CPU bound if it gets better as the CPU gets better. So examples of this are heavy duty math operations, image processing, video processing, a lot of these type of software, it's a lot of CPU work. So like we said before, a faster chef is gonna cut 20, is gonna cut a trillion tomatoes faster than a slower chef, just like a faster CPU is going to matrix multiply one trillion matrices faster than a slower CPU. All right, so hopefully that's clear. Recipes or software that's heavy in math, heavy in CPU processing, these are always bound by CPU. So let's take the other, the other example, which is I.O. bound. The definition, these are all just my definitions from what I understand, but I.O. bound means that the thread of execute a thread of execution is IO bound if its performance is correlated with a subsystem or peripheral or something else that the CPU does not control. So this includes writing files to your hardware or hard disk, sorry, or hard drive. Writing files to your hard drive, waiting for responses from the network. So in our chef example, we said that a more upgraded warehouse with more doors lets the chef store the recipes faster, right? And the analogy for that was actually writing to disk. So writing files to a brand new SSD hard drive is just going to be straight up faster than writing to an old spinning hard drive, right? Waiting on a network response from Reddit, say your software calls Reddit a lot to get all the top, top Reddit posts. Well, your software is going to be limited to how well the Reddit servers are performing, right? If the Reddit servers are being slow, there's actually nothing you can do at that point. You can't get a faster CPU on your computer to improve Reddit server performance. So this is kind of the essence of IO bound. And I hope the distinction between this and CPU, ba CPU bound is more clear now. So last uh, but not least, um, the truth number four, the final truth of this is that programs are more often I.O. bound than they are CPU bound. This is much more practical, like practically maybe like 80, 90 percent of the time, the majority of times programs are going to be I.O. bound and less often they're going to be CPU bound. So that's just truth number four. So many people optimize for this case. And there's less need to optimize for these cases, though they're still possible. So um, to close this video out, I thought it'd be kind of cool to just propose some questions for everyone to think about. These are just random questions that I thought of that hopefully, if you think about them too, it would test your understanding of these kind of things. So question one, if you were to design your own scheduler, how would you give different priority to different programs if you knew they were more I.O. bound or more CPU bound. If you had a CPU that could handle four threads at the same time, and you knew that you only had to run programs that were 100% CPU bound, you never, nothing at all is I.O. bound, how many threads of execution would you practically let your system run at one time? Um, how, would you, how would a scheduler even determine if an execution thread, uh, your software, is more I.O. bound or more CPU bound? How would how would you write a scheduler just to determine that? How would you even figure that out? Um, based on everything we talked about, there's another phrase called memory bound, and I think you guys can probably probably guess what memory bound means. And last, um, if you have a hundred different big objects that are not related to each other, each object requires you to do a bunch of complicated CPU work, and then you got to store that result on your computer. So it's a mix of CPU work and IO work. Uh, let's say you have a dual core processor that can handle eight threads at any point in time. How would you design your software to do this the most efficiently? So those are just some questions to think about. I'm running out of time here. Hopefully this video was helpful for anyone that wanted to just kind of understand better how their software is run on hardware. It's really, really important that you can write software and also understand how that software is executing. So hope this video was helpful. More technical videos to come, and I hope everyone has a great
rest of the week. All right. Take care.